looks great. Oh, super, super, super. Okay. So um, I guess I'd like this to be, um, you know, like, like, like a class. And so, uh, and people do have a lot of questions uh, about chestnuts and, and things like that. So if, um, if, if you, if people are allowed to unmute, I don't know if you, if you let people unmute um, on their own or not, but if you want to do that, or if you just want to down a question and save it to the end um, uh, that that could that could work as well so um, I, I have been involved with chestnut for a really long time now and I first um, found my very first uh, chestnut sprout when I was a undergraduate and I was out uh, taking a field botany course and uh, the systematist um, at the time, Dr. Phil Cantino at OU, uh, kind of dropped to his knees and we thought, you know, he had like seen something miraculous and there was just this little scraggly little twig with a couple of leaves attached to it. And I actually thought he was gonna cry and he proceeded to um, our class about the the basic history and story about the American chestnut and, and what had happened to it and how rare it was to find uh, to find one anymore and so I remembered that and then a few years later when I was in graduate school I was taking a, a course in plant pathology and we had to pick a pathogen to do an in-depth seminar about. And I remembered the chestnut story and I thought, well, I'm gonna pick that one. And so uh, that's how I sort of got involved with the chestnut, um, I don't wanna say restoration necessarily, but I got involved early on with the American Chestnut Foundation and um, they were really kind to a student and um, I got to meet with some of their science folks and they shared materials with me. And so um, I've been kind of with them um, one way or another ever, ever since. So um, a lot of people ask me, um, why, what, what am I doing? What, why am I involved with chestnut? And um, this is not a, that of an uncommon question for me to get. Um, and these are sort of the top reasons why um, I've been involved with chestnut. And people are interested in this tree for all kinds of different reasons. And you can kind of see there, um, you know, depending on your background, you might be a forest or a biologist, you might be a historian. Um, possibly you're just interested in a, in a healthy environment and you're interested in, in reclamation. Um, you might be a woodworker or know somebody who's a woodworker or a craftsman and, and chestnut is a really amazing wood for that. Um, of course, lots of people eat um, chestnuts and lots of people actually don't like to eat chestnuts because most of the chestnuts that are in the stores these days that people um, are able to actually buy and purchase, those are all um, Asian chestnuts and they have have a completely different texture and different flavor than American chestnuts do. Um, American chestnuts have a lot higher fat content um, for good or bad. Anyway, they do. Um, and so for, for all of these reasons, including just conservation of, of a native plant, that's, that's why I study and work on chestnuts. So um, I'm on the National Science Board. I'm on the National Board of Directors. I happen to be the state of Ohio president right now. Uh, and there is actually an Ohio chapter and I'll, I'll show you some of the activities that, that we've been doing um, over time. But, um, you know, the chestnut tree, I, I love this very, very cool picture of the chestnuts here on the left. Um, you know, they were sometimes called or referred to as the redwoods of the east. Um, that's really an exaggeration. They didn't get that big but um, they were certainly one of the largest trees in the forest that we ever had. And um, so if you look um, on the left, this is a, a photo on a ridge top in North Carolina. Um, these are regular loggers and um, chestnuts made really dense stands, especially on ridge tops. Um, they prefer to keep their feet dry. And uh, they, they do something amazing when something happens to the original tree, whether it be old age, lightning, strike or a logger, they copus and they re-sprout from the root collar. And so if you notice, there are three really big chestnuts all surrounding the, the fellow in the middle. 
And uh, those are all probably root sprouts from the original tree um, that he's probably standing on um, right there. And so um, that's uh, kind of how big they got. We don't ever get to see chestnuts that big, although I have a couple of big ones to show you. But um, there's lots of um, you know, different kinds of uh, things historically about chestnut. I'll, I'll show you a little bit of it, um, but you know, there's not hardly a street in the eastern forest range that doesn't, you know, or, or rather a town that doesn't have a street named Chestnut, because a lot of people did that. Um, this is a photo in Michigan from 1980 of a surviving American chestnut. And for whatever reason, that that particular tree just kind of escaped the blight. And so um, it was it was still there in, in the late 80s. Um, and so what happened, um, you know, a uh, uh, a uh, pathogen was brought here, um, and this is um, kind of what it what it looks like. Um, let me, I have to admit somebody there, Mark G just got admitted. Um, and so uh, this is um, Cryphonectria parasitica, the chestnut blight, that's what it, what it looks like. And um, if you look here at these news clippings, we see um, all chestnut trees are here are doomed. Chestnut trees face destruction. Um, and so this was one of the worst pathogens that really, um, you know, has ever hit the United States. I probably, um, even the Dutch elm disease that hit our elm trees in the 50s, it, it left a lot more survivors. Um, and now we're dealing with the emerald ash borer, which is kind of a similar devastation that we've already seen go through here. Um, and so let's see, for some reason, to, there we go. Um, this is the range of the chestnuts, um, the original chestnut uh, Americans that were here. They kind of ranged from Maine all the way down to Georgia. Um, the fungus was first found in 1904 in the Bronx Zoo, and it completely spread through this natural range in about 50 years. Um, it killed between three and five billion American chestnuts. And so it was a really effective pathogen about wiping out trees. Um, these are the susceptible species. So besides American, um, there's also an Allegheny and an Ozark chinkapin. Um, and um, I, I have chinkapin spelled here in two different ways because um, there are a lot of different ways that it's been it's spelled and um, you know, it's just a common name. Um, and so people spell it in different ways. I, actually usually spell it with a Q, but my students tend to spell it with a K. So uh, those are all, uh, um, you know, species here in North America that were all hit with the blight at the same time. Um, that's what the fungus looks like on the outside of the bark of the tree. It's kind of a pretty orangish um, um, fungus and uh, it makes an awful lot of spores. Uh, they get spread in a variety of ways, including, you know, wind, water, animals, birds, squirrels, um, lots of ways for chestnut um, uh, blight to get spread around, including researchers visiting different areas. There are a couple of oaks that also serve as an alternate host for this. Um, it doesn't usually kill the oaks, it just resides on their bark, and so I think er early there was a hope that once the fungus went through and wiped out the chestnuts, we could reintroduce them. But this fungus is here to stay. Um, even if trees haven't, chestnuts haven't been planted in that area for a hundred years, um, there's enough of this blight around um, that it will find and, and, and kill any, any susceptible chestnuts that get planted. Um, so the way it the way it works is it actually uh, makes a girdling canker around the living part of the tree, um, and it kills chestnut trees fairly quickly. Um, usually, a small chestnut about the size of a telephone pole, three to five years on a tree that size, a very very large tree, it, it might take up to a decade to completely kill it, um, because the trees have this. Um, sort of epicormic branching where they, they, they root sprout from their collars. And, um, they will often send up um, little shoots from the base of the tree. Uh, the blight does, doesn't seem to affect the trees um, when the bark is um, more smooth and the bark is younger. But once the trees start to get maybe five to 10 years old, uh, then the blight seems to move in at that point in time and, and kill the tree um, back again. 
Um, this is an old photo um, from Science, and this um, is, is uh, Shenandoah National Park back in 1912. And you can see uh, mid slope, everything that's in flower there um, is actually chestnut. And so chestnut did occur um, sort of in these bands on these ridge tops and mountainsides. And, um, you know, it was, it was a really dominant tree um, in, in the Eastern deciduous forest. Um, there's a ridge top in Shenandoah. This is in 1944. And um, obviously all those trees are dead. And so this was a pretty sad, dramatic sort of thing that happened um, all along the eastern deciduous forest, especially in the Appalachians, um, where chestnut was really prevalent. It's, it's guesstimated that maybe 25 to 30 percent of the forests were chestnut. And so imagine losing 25 percent of the trees out of the woods, what that, what that must have looked like. Um, and I did mention earlier that this, this blight did spread very quickly. It prompted the first Plant Quarantine Act um, in 1912, and it basically wiped out chestnuts as an overstory tree by the 1950s. So, um, I, you know, it's very rare for me to ever get to find anybody who actually remembers seeing chestnut anymore. We have um, a lot of older members in the Chestnut Foundation. When I, when I first started, um, I, I kind of joked that everybody had gray hair and of course now my hair is gray too. So, uh, you know, we, we kind of remember, um, I, you know, I've never seen it an actual chestnut tree, an original chestnut tree um, in the range, but I've seen lots of chestnut sprouts. And so that's, that's kind of where um, it went through and, and killed most of the trees. Um, so I decided that since a lot of people don't have much um, familiarity with chestnut, that I would go through a little bit about um, sort of how chestnuts actually function and some of their biology. And, and hopefully after this talk, you'll be able to actually um, spot one or, or maybe you'll, you'll encounter one out in the woods sometimes. Um, are all of the, the folks that um, are, are frequently found in wild places are exactly the kind of people that we need to help us um, locate some of these surviving trees. Um, so it, it's um, Castanea dentata is the scientific name for American chestnut. It is the member of the Fagaceae family. That's the same family as beech um, chestnuts and oaks. Um, and again, there are several different um, native species to North America, and, and I list those there. Um, I should tell everyone that Allegheny chinkapin um, and Ozark chinkapin, uh, they actually like to live in our area. They're a small, shrubby sort of chestnut, um, actually more like the size of uh, Amur honeysuckle. Uh, not that that's a good thing to emulate, but that's about their size. And they make, they're very prolific nut producers and they make very small little chestnuts. And they are just absolutely wonderful for wildlife, especially for most um, bird species that, that prefer tinier, tinier little nuts. And so those do grow very well. They grow quickly too. So um, those work really well in our area and um, I can help you acquire one if anybody would be interested in, in growing a couple of chinkapins. Um, these are all the non-native Castanea species. Um, again, most of these are the ones that people actually eat. Um, and so if you've had a chestnut and you're like, ooh, that tastes like mush, or I don't like that, or I don't like the texture, it, it was probably a European or a Japanese uh, chestnut, most likely. Um, you might have heard of this one. This is the Dunstan hybrid. Uh, those are the size of the chestnuts. Um, nobody exactly knows um, the pedigree of this particular plant. But it, it, it is the most widely purchased and planted chestnut tree in North America. It does seem to be very blight resistant, but it, it does not have a tree, a, you know, a, a true timber tree form. You can kind of see its picture there. It's more like a, a squatty kind of fruit tree, apple tree size plant. Nothing wrong with that, um, but those are the size of the nuts. Um, and so they are absolutely enormous, which, um, believe it or not, wildlife don't actually prefer. They're, they're just too big. 
Um, and so uh, if, you've, if you've seen any um, tree catalogs and you've seen a Dunstan chestnut listed and it says it's blight resistant, um, they are correct, it seems to be, and, but that's what they look like. And, and again, that's not what I'm interested in restoring. That tree won't make it in the forest. Um, you know, it's, it's only about uh, maybe 20 to 25 feet tall at most, and it would be shaded out really quickly by the other trees. So that's, that's not what we're after. Um, this is what a leaf from an American chestnut looks like. Um, it's, it's pretty sharply toothed um, and they have very small pointed buds. Um, it's simple and alternate for those of you who, 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 who know how to ID trees. Those are some of the things that you look for. Um, it typically flowers late May and June. Um, it is self infertile, meaning that it actually takes two trees to tango. This is been helpful for breeding purposes, but it's also leaves a lot of plants out there in isolation. So there are lots of um, old surviving chestnuts uh, around, but if there's not uh, another one within, let's say 75 feet, 100 feet of it, uh, it's unlikely to ever bear any nuts. So um, it, it does need to, you do need to have two. Um, there's typically three nuts to a burr. These are what the burrs look like. They're very spiny. Uh, take a good look at those. They're a little bit smaller than a tennis ball. Um, let me show you something for reference so you can see how big they are. That's, that's a group of them so you can kind of see the size of them. Uh, this time of year they would be brown. Uh, they usually take several years to completely degrade, at least two to three years to degrade once they've hit the ground. So uh, I know most of the ornithology people spend the, their time looking up, but if you happen to ever sit down on one of these or happen to see a burr, um, let me know about it. That would be great if we could find some from fruit, fruiting chestnuts um, in, in Ohio. Um, this is what the bark looks like. It has a real interesting kind of flat ridges that run up the trees and that is the timber form. That's what that's what an American tree would look like. So oftentimes when people tell me they found a tree and how big it is, um, I'll, I'll ask, could you send me a leaf sample and um, a twig sample? And if they say yes, then usually I know it's not an American chestnut because um, usually the first branches are about 50 feet up off the ground. And so they're kind of hard to reach. Um, so there are lots of folks that are interested in this tree, as I mentioned, for different kinds of reasons. Um, you know, most people know their first experience about chestnut is hearing about chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Uh, that's, that's, that's kind of the, the time of the year where I get a lot of uh, calls about chestnuts when people are like, well, I wonder what chestnut is. But this is considered to be a keystone forest species. And the reason why it's a keystone species is because of how much of an impact it had on other species in the forest. And uh, some of the species had um, a, a really dire time um, when the chestnuts died because they really depended on those seeds in the fall to, to fatten up and to have a steady supply of nuts. Um, it is, it does, um, it's very dependable and it makes um, nuts every year, which is called masting. And so uh, if we look at these different species, um, this is the diameter of the stems over on the left-hand side. Um, so even a small chestnut can make up to 600 um, nuts per year per tree. And it, they're very um, prolific uh, about making um, seeds and, and flowering at a very young age. Um, the chestnuts, it, well, at least when we grow them in an orchard, they will often start flowering at like age five. Um, typically by the time they're eight and 10 years old, they'll start making nuts. Um, by the time a tree would get a little bit bigger, um, have a two foot diameter, you're getting about seven, or sorry, 6,000 nuts per year. Um, and so I think that's, that's kind of amazing how, how that works. Um, white oaks and red oaks um, also make lots of, uh, of nuts. Um, red oaks tend to do, um, you know, they don't, they don't 
make nuts every single year. They skip a couple of years in between. White oaks make lots of nuts every year. So as far as doing restoration ecology, chestnut is a really great one to add into the mix, um, especially if you're trying to restore wildlife habitat. So, you know, it's, it's great to have oaks in that mix, but, you know, waiting 20, 25 years to have some wildlife food is a long time. So adding some chestnuts into some of the mineland work I've done um, is a really good way of getting a lot of wildlife in um, to an area pretty quickly. Um, and, and I have a little joke on here that size does matter, but um, as far as wildlife goes, um, there's a definite feeding preference uh, about these nuts, um, especially for jays and grouse. They prefer the size of the nut of the American or the chinkapins. Uh, some of those hybrid nuts um, are just too large for them, and so they, they actually don't eat them, they can't eat them. Um, the other interesting thing about the American tree versus the um, non-native species is that these nuts actually stay in the burr. Um, and so a lot of the other nuts, um, the burr opens up and the nuts fall right out on the ground. But um, with the American, um, for several days after the burr actually opens up, uh, there, there are, it's, it's, it's sort of stuck inside of there. And um, that makes it really great um, for some of the bird dispersers to be able to grab a, a seed and go. Um, jays um, particularly are very good at, at doing that. And so that's a difference between the American and the, and the other species as well. Um, where the nuts are actually located inside of there, that's super, super soft. It, it feels like the softest velvet that you've ever touched. And these nuts do not have um, a sharp tip on them like a lot of the acorns do. So wildlife really do love chestnuts and um, it doesn't take them very long to find them once you have them in an area. Uh, most of them don't know what they are at first because they've not, they, they've not encountered them before, but it doesn't take them very long to get the word out that this is, this is great eating. Um, besides um, the, the qualities of the nuts, 96% um, of the songbirds rear their young on insects. Um, I assume everybody on, the, on this call probably already knows that, but native plants can um, really host, um, you know, twice as many Lepto Leptodoptera species as non-native plants. And so we need to encourage planting of, and, and restoration and restoring of native plants. And there's uh, some really cool active research going on um, with some of the chestnut re restoration plots that we've established uh, with uh, different researchers, entomologists, um, biologists, field folks that are actually starting to document and look at it, these insect relationships because by the time people did those kind of quantitative studies, most of the chestnut forests were gone. So um, we don't really have a lot of that kind of information. Uh, I know everyone knows what wild turkeys are, but um, you know one of the wild problems with the wild turkey is that um, it, when the chestnuts were gone, it lost one of its really important um, foodstuffs. Um, there's a lot of historical accounts that indicate that chestnut was a favorite food of the turkey, and um, you know the problem is that they, that they actually kill and eat the nuts. They are not a disperser, but you know they're a bird. They're a native bird. They're important. Um, the Wild Turkey Federation was actually a very early sponsor of chestnut research, and. Um, we um, actually, their CEO became our CEO for a short time. And so uh, the Wild Turkey Federation um, did help while they were bringing turkeys back to everywhere. And, and now I guess, you know, there's plenty of turkey around again. Uh, they were helping us with chestnut work as well. Um, so I, I have questions. People ask me, is the American chestnut actually extinct? Um, the answer is no, it's not extinct. It's usually found as a root sprout on the left. 
Um, that's what everybody should be out looking for. Um, we are actively looking for sprouts, particularly in Ohio. We're almost at the far western range of where the original chestnuts were, and we don't have um, a, a lot of germplasm collected from our area. So we're we're really looking for these now. Um, finding the the burrs on the ground is the easiest way to find a chestnut. Um, although most of these small sprouts will never get big enough to, to make a burr. Um, there's a big 85 foot flowering chestnut in Maine. Um, I got to see that tree in person a couple of years ago and, and it was pretty spectacular looking to see a tree that large still. Um, this, these are a couple of Miami students. Um, there was a disjunct population of chestnuts in Wisconsin. Um, this uh, a disjunct meaning it's outside their native range. And um, so that tree was approximately 90 years old or so, something like that. Um, and uh, the, um, this whole forest was started by some folks relocating from Pennsylvania to Wisconsin about 100 years ago. And they brought a few chestnuts with them and planted them and um, those few handful of chestnuts became a forest of 5,000 chestnuts. Uh, it was a, a real pleasure to get to do some of the first ecological studies in that forest. Um, and a lot of my work has been done with Miami students, undergraduates and graduate students, and a lot of them are still um, involved with Chestnut even now, which um, I think we that's important because um, I'm, I'm getting older and, and we need more people. So um, that it's been kind of exciting to get to introduce new students to, to Chestnut work. Um, there were lots of early attempts to battle the blight. Um, there were quarantines, there were mass logging events. Um, there was um, some irradiation. I'll show you some pictures of those kinds of things. Um, what you're seeing here um, is a, a chestnut tree um, in Wisconsin um, at, in that stand that had blight. And um, that tree was uh, sprayed with fungicides, pesticides, and then sealed. And they were trying to stop the blight from getting into the rest of that forest. But unfortunately, um, all of those efforts did not work. And that chestnut forest in Wisconsin um, soon followed suit with all the other chestnut forests and um, the blight has taken most of the trees that that were there. So, you know, when I heard about the emerald ash borer and they started talking about quarantines and then, you know, doing kind of radial loggings out from an infection point, I was like, been here, done this. This is, this is something that the you know, has already tried and failed with the chestnut tree. And so uh, let's talk a little bit more about that irradiation because it's kind of interesting. And so um, basically um, back in the 50s, uh, you know, the solution to everything was to, to radiate it. And so uh, the commission, um, somebody had the, the idea, um, it's called the Stronghold Program. Um, they published this article back in 1955 asking anybody if they had any surviving chestnut trees left that were still making nuts to send the nuts um, to the Atomic Energy Commission and they uh, were trying to, um, they, they irradiated them with gamma rays to try to artificially create a mutation that would make those seeds resistant to the blight. And uh, they, they did that for several years and they did trigger all kinds of odd um, and interesting mutations, including some of them that were resistant to the blight. And uh, here's, here's a few trees that have been planted there for you know, many years, 50, more than 50 years, and they are resistant to the blight, but the bad part is that um, the seeds they produced are not resistant to the blight. Um, so those trees are here. We can use them, um, although we don't use them in the breeding program because of their irradiation, but we can use them for other studies. And uh, you can actually find some of these um, at the Rio Grande farm of Bob Evans. So the original Bob Evans Sr., he got interested because he had chestnuts on his farm, on his property, and he participated in this program. And so there are still 
kill um, some of these uh, irradiated trees that he was sent back the seeds and he planted them and they're there now. Um, so if anybody ever gets over to Bob Evans Farms, they probably aren't doing farm days this year because of COVID, but um, you can um, ask to see those trees because, because they're still there. So uh, literally everything that could be done to save this tree was, was tried. And, um, and, and you know, the result was that most of these things did not work. Um, so what are we doing today? So there's grafting where if we find a root sprout, um, we will graft that to um, um, uh, uh, the base of a, a tree in an orchard so we can keep that germplasm grow, going. So that's one of the reasons why I want to, people in Ohio to help me find some surviving sprouts. Um, we've been doing that for a, a few years. Um, our grafting success is pretty low. Um, it's it's difficult to find the exact right size cyan wood. Um, we can keep them going for a few years, but then we have to graft again to keep them going. So this is an ongoing kind of slow process, but at least we're able to, to keep those trees around for a while. Um, there's been some interesting things with biological control that I'm going to speak to you about. And then crossbreeding, which is really what the Ch Chestnut Foundation has been up to for a long time. And then the latest, um, you know, methods are using genetic engineering. Um, and SUNY um, uh, Forest um, School is, is, has been working in developing those trees. And we'll just spend a, a few minutes talking about that. So as far as the biological control, um, we're talking here about hypovirulence. And so this was actually discovered in France um, at about the same time as um, the trees were dying in America, they were also dying in Europe. And um, so anywhere there were these susceptible chestnut species, they, they were also getting sick. But they, they got sick and then they recovered. And so researchers from the United States went there to see why, why did our trees die, but these Castanea dentata are okay now. And they found that there was a native fungus, or sorry, a native virus um, in France. Um, and when that virus encountered the fungus. It attacked the fungus and it changed it from being a very virulent kind of yellowish form to changing its color to be almost white. So if you look in the petri dish there on the bottom right hand corner, that is the chestnut blight fungus after it has been treated with the virus. So that's what hypovirulence really is. Um, and the way we do that is we um, take um, some of this um, virus out. We find um, a, a place a, on the tree where there's already blood growing. Uh, we make a small wound with a little cork borer and we put some of that um, hypovirus in there. Um, and so that's, that's the idea behind it. And um, it does cause these big, horrible, ugly looking cankers that you can see on these two trees, um, but it, the trees survive. So we can save individual chestnut trees by, by doing this work. The reason this did not work in the United States is that we had several strains of the fungus here already by the time we tried to do this. And there um, has to be some kind of compatibility between that virus and the fungus or it doesn't actually spread on its own. And so despite lots and lots and lots of work um, done in that Wisconsin forest trying to save those trees, a lot of that work was done at West Virginia University by Bill McDonald and Mark Double, if anybody happens to know them. They spent their whole careers trying to get this to work. Um, and um, lo and behold, they found out how many different strains of the, vi of the fungus there actually are. So uh, their counterparts have picked up that work and now they um, think they have, quote, a super donor virus, which um, will be compatible with all strains of the fungus. And so that research um, is fairly new in the last five years and, and they're working really hard to see um, if, if that is true, if that really is a super donor. And uh, that would mean that people who have an existing American chestnut tree, we can treat it with that virus kind of like giving it an immunization and um, it would then keep that, um, that tree alive.
So the Chestnut Foundation, which I've referred to a couple of times, and some of you might actually even be a member, um, it was founded in, back in 1983 by scientists and volunteers. And they have a really simple mission to return the chestnut to the forest canopy. So we're not interested in just having orchards or just having a breeding program. We actually want to be able to develop a tree that will be able to survive um, on its own in, um, and, and take its place back in the canopy of the forest. So they had a pretty simple idea back, back then about doing something called a back cross breeding program. And um, their idea was to make, um, take, to make produce a tree that had a real high level of blight resistance. Um, they wanted to retain all of the American chestnut characteristics and including the, the size of the nut, um, the fact that the nuts stay in the burn, don't drop on the ground, um, the timber quality and the timber size of the tree. Um, and these were all things that are necessary if that tree is going to uh, adapt and survive and be able to put back into the forest. And so uh, they simply found some, um, you know, surviving American chestnuts, um, uh, did a breeding project where they put them back with a Chinese. Most the Chinese trees are fairly resistant to this fungus. Um, this fungus did um, come in from China and those trees have um, a pretty good immunity to it. And so that's how this whole program started. Um, and then they would take those um, offspring that were half American and half Chinese. They would expose them to the blight. Anybody who was resistant to the blight would go on in the breeding program. And then they would back cross those back again to another American tree. And the idea here is with several back crosses, we would eventually be able to come up with a tree that had all of these amazing characteristics and at the same time um, be mostly uh, mostly American. We would just keep the genes for resistance. So that's what we knew back in the 80s when the foundation started and um, you know it was a kind of a simplistic approach and they were guessing that there were two to three genes responsible for resistance and uh, keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, that, that is not the case. There's actually nine different genes that are responsible for resistance. Um, and so again, that, that kind of tells you where, where, where TACF is with this back cross breeding program. Um, they've repeated it enough times now um, that we have three of the back crosses completely finished. Um, a lot of those trees have been introduced um, um, as part of restoration um, to see how they would do. Um, I'm kind of disappointed with the outcome, um, but now that we have a new geneticist and we have new all kinds of technology at our disposal, um, and we know that there's actually nine genes in, involved, um, I'm not surprised to find out that a lot of these back cross trees are still susceptible. Um, they, they have varying degrees of resistance to the blight. Um, and the good thing is by planting out all these trees, we've learned a lot about how to do this and how to restore trees and how to get them to grow and, and what kind of pitfalls we might run into. So um, that's kind of where the Chestnut Foundation is right now with their, with their breeding program. Um, with all of the new amazing um, technologies that are available. Um, originally, we were typically just using kind of a phenotypic um, um, selection, looking at you know, the, the leaves, looking at flowers, looking at seeds, looking at wood structure, just physically looking at what did those trees look like. But now we can actually use um, a different approach and actually look at the resistance genes within those trees. Um, and um, that's, that's moved us forward very quickly in the, in the last five years. Um, just like people can, you know, get a DNA kit um, from uh, Ancestry.com, well, we can also now do that for trees that we find in the wild. Um, we can sequence their DNA and, and look for genes of interest, and um, it's, it's really um, helping the breeding program um, move along really, really pretty fast. Um, so I, I mentioned that we're 
trying to develop this reference genome and do genetic mapping. Um, we have the complete sequence for um, both the Chinese chestnut and the American chestnut now. And so it's a matter of taking time um, and, and people who know how to do that kind of work, that's not me, uh, going through the different um, genes of interest to figure out which ones are the ones that we need to target to make sure that we um, end up with a resistant tree. And so this, this work has all taken place again in the last um, less than 10 years, uh, most of it in the last five years. Um, and so I thought since I have um, you all as, as you know, you were here in Ohio, we should talk a little bit about chestnuts in Ohio. And this is Mike Vincent, which many of you know, recently retired from Miami's herbarium and, and faculty. Um, he helped a student a couple of years ago do a really interesting project um, all across Ohio. Um, looking for um, the original footprint of where chestnuts used to reside in Ohio. Um, with his help, um, the student found more than 200 specimens. Um, some of the specimens went um, back to 1884 and some were as new as 2010. And so they used herbarium at universities all across Ohio. Um, here are some of those specimens, kind of what they looked like. Um, so this again um, goes back to the idea of um, why do we want to collect voucher specimens of things like ash trees and why did these people back then collect something so common as a chestnut? Well, you, you never know what can be learned from, from seeing those samples. Even just being able to trace back the footprint of where these trees lived, um, we're able to do that now with, with, with these herbaria. Um, she also looked through thousands of forestry archives. There's a huge database that OSU has put together. And um, time and time again, um, especially for logging purposes, it said mixed hardwoods. That was the most common entry that she kept running into. Um, as the blight started wiping out chestnuts, then um, people started entering when they found chestnuts because they knew it was kind of a special or rare tree. And so then she found more of those after the 1950s um, listed as chestnut. Um, this is somebody in um, Worcester um, back in 1961. Um, there was a, the Ag Ohio Agricultural um, Experimental Station there, and they are grafting some trees to, to put into the breeding program um, that they were trying to do at the time. Um, this is um, a, a sort of a quick map. Um, I have a lot of other detailed maps, but we really don't have time for that tonight. Um, showing um, the results of the students project. And by the way, that was a Savannah Ballweg. Um, she just graduated a few years ago and she just finished up with her master's at Ohio State last year. Um, so this was kind of her senior project that she did when she was an undergraduate. And so these are all of the cases um, of chestnut, um, uh, the, the black dots, and I apologize for the resolution. Um, that's that's the, the best one that I could get for, for this talk. Um, the black dots are um, chestnut records where they found the herbarium records and um, they know that chestnut was there um, historically. And the green dots are places where she found um, specimens um, in the herbaria. And so that's kind of where they all were. Um, the ones that are kind of smattered over here um, in our part of the corner of Ohio, um, those are all mostly recent records and those are probably things that I planted, so, or somebody planted. Um, so where does chestnut like to, or prefer to live? Um, it's all a matter of pH. And um, they prefer to be on an acidic type soil, absolutely not on limestone soil. Um, if you look at the geological map of Ohio, we have some really super interesting geology here. And so pretty much um, for the, if you divide Ohio almost in half, uh, the eastern half central area, that's where we could find chestnut. There are a few pockets of it down here in the south, but um, pretty rare. It's, it's again, all has to do with the soil type. Um, we started the Ohio chapter back in 2004 because um, I was going to these chestnut meetings and chestnut conferences and 
hearing, oh, this was happening on, you know, in this area and this was happening somewhere else. And I was like, why don't we have a chapter in Ohio? And it's sort of like, well, then, then make one. And so uh, several scientists and myself um, and volunteers, uh, we decided that we should have a, a state of Ohio Chestnut Foundation chapter. And so we started that. Um, we originally focused on mineland restoration because that, that was my area of interest. And that's what I was doing at the time. We're, we're, we're working on these old strip mines from Ohio. And uh, the soil is, is very acidic and very poor. And uh, people don't really care what you do there because nothing else is growing there. And so I was able to use that area for a lot of, a lot of plantings. Um, this is one of the larger plantings I did. Um, this is Tri-Valley Wildlife Management Area, which is among Skingham County. And um, this picture, although it looks very pretty, um, all of those plants that you see in the foreground are all invasive. So after they finish strip mining the coal out of this territory, this land, uh, they put down this um, kind of very fast, aggressive um, vegetation seed mix. And that has really prevented any kind of woody succession from happening. And so um, I had to deal, figure out how, how, to, how do you, you know, you have poor soils, you have this really aggressive mix and how are you gonna get trees to grow in it? So luckily um, I, I'm a gardener and a, a botanist and I, and I like to figure out these things. So we, we tried a few things and uh, we brought in some heavy equipment and we had to rip and plow and disc this land in different ways um, to try to break up the compacted soil. Um, these are, this is a picture of a small part of the planting. We planted about 1,100, almost 1,200 chestnuts. Um, we planted a variety of different kinds of chestnuts, including pure Americans and the hybrid ones. They were all one year old um, bare root seal seedlings at the time. Um, this is a year later. We had absolutely amazing survival um, for the first year in the treated plots, the control plots where we didn't do anything to the soil. We didn't break up the compaction. We had really poor survival. But in these other areas, the trees did really well. Um, if you notice the trees are in cages, uh, that's because wildlife love to eat chestnut seedlings. So they don't only eat the nuts, but they also love to browse on the trees themselves. So um, uh, we, we didn't have enough money to buy formal tree tubes, so we used student labor, which is free or extra credit free, and uh, we made these cages out of chicken wire for, for the trees. Um, five years later, um, you can see nuts being produced here, and um, it, it's been a, a, a marvel to see the difference in this area. I took students back a couple of years ago in the fall and um, it was actually like walking into a young forest. The trees were over um, 30 feet tall and uh, most of them were producing a lot of nuts and they were actually shading out those aggressive plants um, that I showed you originally, which is, which is what we expected to have happen. Um, the, this is a list of some of the Ohio chapter activities that we've been focusing on. We did establish a germplasm repository at Mohican State Forest. And so anytime we find a surviving American sprout, uh, we try to um, clone that usually by grafting and um, move that into the Mohican State Forest area. And, and these keys, trees are um, being used in the breeding program for all kinds of things. And I have Can You Help? Uh, so if anybody happens to come across a chestnut sprout, um, if you could first take a GPS coordinate so we can go find it again. Um, sometimes people tell me, oh, there's a sprout over there somewhere, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, you go wander around and try to find that little sprout later on. It's really difficult. So uh, we're looking um, to incorporate as much um, Ohio germplasm as we can. Um, we continued with more mineland plantings. Um, a lot of that has been done um, by the Appalachian um, Reforestation Restoration Group. And so they're doing thousands of mixed plantings. They're, they're you know, planting all kinds of uh, hardwood species, including chestnut, 
um, on a lot of these old strip mines. We've been doing a lot of educational demonstration plantings. I'll show you a few pictures of those. We have some progeny tests um, in orchards and at Dawes Arboretum of these restoration chestnuts. Um, also at the Wayne National Forest, um, we've done some of that. We've got lots and lots of folks involved, um, including the Forest Service and ODNR. We started a new small grants program that's up to about $1,000 to help um, trigger some of these activities and to help foster and stimulate some research. And so um, that's what I've been doing as um, Ohio chapter president for a while. Um, these are where a lot of the plantings are. Um, there are some, um, a few chestnuts out at the Ecology Research Center. After the ashes blew over, we tried to put some there just to see if they would be able to um, handle our pH. And I tried using my gardening skills and giving them near acid and, and fertilizer and all of those kinds of things, but they are not happy. They're just kind of sitting there. Um, here's just a few pictures of some of these educational plots and, and they're really scattered all over the place. And so if anybody knows of a good chestnut site, um, a forage camp or anything like that, or a nature center, um, and it would be a good chestnut habitat and it's, and it's open to the public, uh, then you can talk to me about one of those small grants. And um, we have lots of members who like to get involved doing this kind of stuff. And, and maybe we can do a, a, another chestnut education plot. We, I'm going to just show you a few pictures now real quickly. Um, this is um, from the Wayne National Forest. Um, this was um, one of the first progeny tests that got planted. Um, we had a lot of students show up. These are all Miami students. Um, come, they came all the way over with me in a couple of vans and um, OU and Hawking College was there as well. We actually had over 80 volunteers come to help that day. You can see a lot of people standing around. I think it was like you know, once, once, once they saw the young college students there, they were like, okay, let them dig the holes. And so um, it was a beautiful day. It was a very nice fall day. Um, we've done a lot of Arbor Day and Earth Day events all around the state. And um, I can't tell you how exciting it is for young people to plant a tree. Um, for a lot of us, that's just something that's kind of second nature. We planted lots of trees in our lifetimes. But for lots and lots of people, especially if they um, grew up in a city, um, they are don't know about this and they they want to always come back and see their tree. And so um, I always encourage Arbor Day and Earth Day events and we try to provide um, seedlings for, for those things whenever we're actually asked work with a lot of school groups. Um, this are, these are some pictures of ODNR and um, Stephen Rist um, is, um, he's a, a state chapter, uh, he's our secretary because he was out of the room when we needed one and we decided he would do a good job for us. Um, and so he's actually in charge of a lot of the state forests in the eastern part of Ohio. Um, this is uh, Sayado Trail Forest. Um, those are all, they're just little chestnut seedlings, all of those tree tubes. Um, I put this picture here to make sure that I express my gratitude for all the volunteers who always come out and help us. Sitting there putting these tree shelters on these little trees is very time consuming and kind of tedious. It's not hard work, it just takes some time. And uh, usually we, we will send out an announcement about where we're doing something and, and people will show up. It just amazes me how that happens. Um, here's those same trees. Um, that's July. So they, they were planted. Um, I believe those were planted in March or um, that might have been a late fall planting even in December. And so that's what a happy chestnut looks like um, after it's been planted for just a few months. Um, and again, if we don't keep them in the tree tubes, the deer will just mow them down. Um, Hawking State Forest, we've had a lot of plantings there. We did a big 2000 seedling planting. Um, it took 10 days um, for us to plant that many trees and to put shelters on them. We had a lot of volunteers. Um, we also, the service foresters, um, they volunteered their weekends to come and help us as well. Um, this was a, 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 a clear cut area. And so the trees had already been harvested from this area and it was really hard. There's a lot of brambles, a lot of um, debris on the ground, and that's where we planted. So here's just a few pictures of that. 
again, tree tubes, it's all about tree tubes. And um, it's pretty amazing how fast these trees grew. This is in May. There's some chestnuts coming up out of the tubes. Um, this is in July. This is Ryan Homesher, who's from Middletown, and Dr. Gilland, who is from Liberty Township. Both of these people are professors now, but they still continue to come over and help with this project. Um, so um, once a year, they get together and we go and we see how these trees are, are, are doing. Um, City of Hamilton, um, we, we tried to do an Arbor Day planting. They have a fantastic um, forester there. Um, and so we did this back in 2017, even though I had my doubts because of I've tried already to grow trees locally and they don't like it here. These are what trees look like a few months later when they're not happy. And so you can kind of see they're just sitting there. They're kind of yellowy. They're not, they're not doing well. These trees should be four or five feet tall by now. And that, that's, that's what happens when you plant them on limestone-based soil. They don't do well. Um, there's a few more pictures. Um, this particular area, besides just being on limestone, also part of it was wet. And over on the right-hand side, um, that's a, a, another root pathogen that's killed that tree. Um, called um, uh, Phyth Phytophthora cinnamoni that's killed that tree. Um, Ark of Appalachia has a lot of our nice trees there for people who visited Ark of Appalachia. Maybe you've gotten to see some of them. They have um, a, a nice um, planting of some of the different types of chestnuts and some educational signage up. Um, there's some Benton Furnace um, is an experimental forest in Ohio. Um, they have some of our work too. These trees are only three years old and the circle around the one on the right is to show you that that tree already has a burr on it. So that's not necessarily great for a tree to start fruiting um, at age three, but anyway, it did. Um, and so what's next? Um, I would like all of you to watch this TED Talk. I'm sure most of you are familiar with TED Talks. If you search on TED for um, Dr. Powell and Chestnut, you will come up with his um, amazing talk, talking to you a little bit about how he's developed this blight-resistant chestnut. Um, he basically took a, a gene from wheat and inserted it into the American chestnut genome. And those trees are 100% American, except for those wheat genes, and they are resistant to the fungus. And so those trees are actually um, under federal review right now. Um, USDA is um, reviewing the permit to allow those trees to be um, released for experimental purposes. And then I think they have to clear the FDA and the EPA. But um, the USDA is, is the big hurdle here. And um, that's cost about $3 million to um, get these trees to this point and to get them through this regulatory review process. Um, again, most of that money was raised by Chestnut chapters and especially the New York chapter. They, they funded a tremendous amount of this work. I know a lot of people, when they hear genetically engineered things, they, they, they immediately take a dislike to it. But I think a lot of that has to do with um, the whole issue about Monsanto and, and some of those things. And that's not the case here. These trees will never be sold for profit. Um, these trees are um, you know, just the first, the next step to kind of figuring out how to quickly get some kind of blight resistant tree so we can um, restore these genomes. Every time, um, every year, we're losing more and more of those little seedlings in the forest. Um, they, they're being impacted by all kinds of things. So this is the next step um, that um, the forest, um, sorry, that the Chestnut Foundation is, is taking to try to work, work with SUNY to do this. Um, and we continue to do a lot of mineland restoration work um, and actually are collaborating with some of the mine, um, mine owners. So as they close these mines and they want to um, revegetate them, we're working with them as well. Um, and so this is a multi-generation project. Um, I've, I've encouraged a lot of students to get involved, um, but we really need a lot more people, a lot more hands-on um, to be able to get this to, to actually come to fruition. 
And uh, so there's my cell number. If anybody has any comments or ideas or questions, um, there's my Miami email address. And um, I, I guess the, the, the best thing I could ask everybody to do is to help me find any Ohio chestnuts that might still be out there so we could bring them into the breeding program. And I think that's, that's all I have. Um, I, I went a few minutes over, I think, a little bit, but um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or if you have time for questions. Sure, yeah, and everybody, please type any questions you have in the chat box here. Uh, but Carolyn, we do have one currently from Jim Michael. Um, sure. His question is, what is the survival rate of the trees we're planting now? Um, so if you mean the survival because of all the things that can happen to little trees, or do you mean the survival due to the blight? Due to the blight. Okay, um, I would say there's somewhere about 50%. Um, some of them, um, we have a new geneticist that took over about three years ago, and he was pretty ruthless in the breeding orchard. And anything that showed any kind of blight susceptibility at all, he immediately had all of those tree trees taken out of the breeding program. Um, our former geneticist and breeder was Fred Hebbard, and he never met a chestnut tree he didn't like. And he incorporated a lot of trees into the breeding program because maybe where they were located or they had a certain something about them that he liked them. So he, he brought them into the breeding program. And so uh, we've, we've actually eliminated about 5,000 trees out of the breeding program. And so the trees that we planted last year and the ones that we expect to plant this year, they're gonna be more like 75% blight resistant. And I think that's as, as good as we can get with traditional breeding. Um, I don't think we're ever gonna come up with 100% because we have those non-genes overcome. And so I think that's about as best as, as we're gonna get. And another question here, Carolyn. Um, we have a participant asking uh, if you're just interested in Ohio chestnut discoveries. Um, they actually live in Kentucky. Oh, okay. So no, um, there. You know, as as you can imagine, there's a Kentucky chapter as well. But um, the Chestnut Foundation received a grant a couple of years ago, um, and it, it actually started about a year ago, right before COVID, where um, we have money to search for surviving chestnut sprouts in the entire range. Um, they first looked at where they already had records from and which states were not well represented. Um, Kentucky had has a lot. K Kentucky has had a, had originally a lot of chestnuts and still does, um, and so they they would be interested in any um, oh, uh, sprouts. So they're really just looking for original American sprouts at this time. We're not really looking for hybrids or Chinese chestnuts or things like that. But yes, they would they would be very interested, um, especially if it's reachable. So if it's if it's not where you have to you know hike 10 miles to go find it. Um, if it was actually where we had an address and a GPS point, they would really like to know about it too. Great, and uh, I have a quick question for you actually. Sure, sure. In this area of Ohio, it, let's say general glaciated Ohio, is soil pH really the only limiting factor there? Um, preventing reestablishment? Um, soil pH and clay. So um, they absolutely do not um, do well in heavy clay. Um, uh, that other pathogen that I showed you is a root rot and they're pretty susceptible to that. So there have been a few places where we find, found maybe um, an area that had um, maybe an old gravel or, or sand pit or something like that. And that's really good places to grow chestnut. And they seem to be able to overcome the pH if they are on really, really well-drained areas. But if you find like some beautiful, rich, dark, wonderful looking soil, they won't grow there. 
So um, that's, that's what I had to work with at the ERC. And I thought, okay, these trees are going to make it. And so we, we, we added several things to lower the pH and um, the trees are just kind of sitting there. They're, they're not happy. Thank you. Um, sure. Another question that just came in, um, and you may have to correct my pronunciation here. Do the Chiquathin trees? Chinkapins. Chinkapin trees do well yes. in Southwest Ohio soil. They do, and uh, they, 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 they will do well here, and uh, they're easy to grow, and uh, they don't take up a lot of room, and they do make a, a, a really nice abundant supply of nuts for wildlife. Um, the nuts are really too small for people. Um, it would, you know, it's like eating wild grapes. Yeah, you could do it, but why would you want to? Um, but the wildlife love those little chinkapin nuts. All right, that looks like all the questions we have here. But Carolyn, I just want to say a big thank you oh, for sure. taking the time and meeting with us digitally. Sure, sure. Well, thank you a lot for inviting me. And um, I, I never know where these talks are going to go because sometimes um, somebody will hear a talk and then maybe six months later, they send me a picture of a chestnut they find. So um, if you guys can help me get the word out and keep your eyes down on the ground while you're looking for birds, that would be great. Sure, okay. sure. And with your permission, uh, we will po post the recording on our website. Oh, no problem. Great. Thank you. And I'll send you a link if you'd like to share that yes. with with anyone? Sure, I'll, I'll put that on the Ohio chapter. We have a website too, so I'll, I'll, I'll share that with them as well. Perfect, perfect. Well, thanks again, Carolyn. It was great. It was very informative. Good. Well, thank and, you, everybody. Uh, thanks, everyone, for participating. Sure. Thank you. And, uh, you guys keep up the good work too. Thank you so much, and have a great night, everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye.